worship. Yeah, let's stand. We're gonna sing praises to our Lord and Savior this morning. Thanksgiving, you know, we were thinking, what does that call us to? Thanksgiving calls us to remember what God has done. We're thankful because God has done so much for us. He saved us from our sins. He's brought us into new, everlasting life. Who's thankful for that? New and everlasting life. Yeah. And so what that does, thankfulness does, is it causes us to, to worship him. And so 
Um, if you want to turn your attention to the screens, we, we have a video just talking about why we worship Jesus. When we gather on the weekend as a community of believers, we start each service with worship. Sometimes we start with celebration, sometimes with confession. But each and every week, we sing. So we want to ask you, why do you sing? I sing because of his love and mercy that I don't deserve, yet he gives freely. I sing because he's worthy. I sing because he rescued me. I sing because God is faithful. When we sing, we unify our heart, soul, mind, and strength to the Lord. We declare that we belong to him, we are his people, and that he is the one true God. We remember that he is maker and creator of all things. We declare his goodness, his mercy, and his pursuing love for humanity. I sing because he's my father. I sing because God has never let me down. I sing because of what he's done for me. I sing because I have so much to be thankful for because of Jesus. We sing because we were once lost, but now are found. We declare that we are alive in Jesus. We proclaim victory over sin and death, not just for the life to come, but for today. We sing because we have been marked by God's presence and we are full of joy. I sing in response to what he's done for me. I sing because I am loved. I sing because I'm a child of God. I sing because he alone deserves my worship. We sing because he is worthy. We remember that his kingdom will fully come on earth as it is in heaven. When we worship, we join in the song of the heavens. I sing because of the hope I have that God is restoring all things. I sing because as I sing to him, he sings over things of my life. I sing because he is holy. I sing because my sins have been forgiven. I sing because he saved me. We sing because we are thankful. We sing because of all the things we can do on this earth. What else can we give but our adoration, our love, and our devotion? And because he first loved us, we worship. I sing because I was made to 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 worship.
stars they wept The morning sun was dead The savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse
forever lives to make intercession for us. Amen and amen. Well, before you take a seat, why don't you turn to somebody you didn't come to church with today and say hello. Good morning, Harvest. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and uh, welcome. It's great to serve the Lord together here as we interact with each other, as we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Well, my name is John. I serve as one of the pastors, and if you're relatively new or you're brand new to Harvest, I'm glad you made your way here today through that blustery storm of one inch of snow. But uh, I would love to have an opportunity to meet you after the service. I'm going to be hanging out in the lobby, and I would love to get your name. If there's something you have as a question or a way that you'd like it to, to get connected, maybe in community, I would love to answer any questions that you have about that. And if you've been at Harvest for any period of time, you know that we have an app. It's called the Harvest Bible Chapel App Chicago. And on that app, there's an opportunity for you to put a prayer request. There's an opportunity for you to check out things during the week. Like if you want to get into a community group, you can literally click on one of those buttons and it will help you uh, get more connected in the church. And hope that's an encouragement to you. Well, church, uh, o- over these last months, since April, on the first weekend of the month, we have set aside something as a special offering. And uh, I would love for you to hear and be encouraged by how that money has gone to good use for the Lord's work. So direct your attention to the screen. Hey, Harvest family, Dave and Ramirez. We just want to give you a quick update about what the Lord's been doing through the special offerings as a church family this year. Back in April, we started collecting the special offering on the first weekend of every month. Mm -hmm. And really, the simple idea was to invite our whole church family to be generous towards specific points of need, showing compassion Mm -hmm. and care in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So for this year, we've had eight months to do that, April through November, across all six campuses, and your generosity has provided a special offering total of $86,599. Now, all of that is separate from the general fund, and it's giving that's going specifically to uh, practical ways to provide for others at key points of need. Yeah, Harvest, through our church and ministries, we have been able to fund Hope Centers mm-hmm. at our Crystal Lake, Rolling Meadows, and Elgin campuses, yeah. serving a thousand families a month. Wow. And then there's our Serve Our City projects in our community near each campus. Mm-hmm. Scholarships for 43 students for Camp Harvest and High Five. And we also did back to school supplies Love for it. children and students in our local communities. And more than 450 Thanksgiving meals and Christmas blessings for the families in need. Mm-hmm. Leadership development, man, funding apprentices, serving at your local campus. (laughs) So all of that is what's been happening kind of in and through our church. Beyond that, we were also able to give another $30,000 to support these ministries, Uh, Safe Families and Mm -hmm. Lydia Children's Home, which is involved with foster care for kids, Mm -hmm. Uh, the Ruth Project, which helps families who are adopting and in foster care, and then uh, World Relief and Christian Aid Mission. Now, those gifts were specifically towards helping refugees and many who are affected by the conflict in Israel. Wow. It's so encouraging to see the practical and personal ways you have all engaged with these special offering opportunities. It's true. So the whole idea of the special offering is to invite generosity to others in the name of Jesus. Now for December, we want to do the special offering in a little different way. We want to invite you now to pray and consider where could you be a blessing to others in the name of Jesus in December. Yeah, and Harvest, maybe it's a person or a family member that you know who might need help or a ministry that helps people in hard times or something else that the Lord leads you to. That's right. So pray, decide to bless somebody else, and then go do it. One of the best things we ever get to do with money is to give. So we hope you'll lean into this special offering in December by personally finding a way to be a blessing to others. Yeah. Well, that's incredible, yeah. The generosity of us has benefited the Lord's work in such great ways. And so think about this December. 
the opportunity we have to look around right in front of us and to think about the monies that the Lord has given us to steward. How can we bless a person? How can we bless an organization where the Lord is at work and let's be about the work of the Lord together. So be generous. Make that be the theme of your December as we think about ways to give. Well, I love the fact that there's another church that we're gonna be praying for today. It's Calvary uh, Church and Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park. And Gerald Heastand is their pastor. He was on staff here for a period of time. He's the lead pastor there. And uh, they are sharing the gospel with boldness and fervency. And I asked him the other day through a text, like, hey, how can we be praying for you? He goes, well, we have 22 migrants from Venezuela who are gonna be living in the basement of our church for a short period of time until they find permanent housing. So would you as a church pray for, and I'm like, for sure we will, pray that the Lord would give wisdom and discernment in the interactions that they have, and that the Lord would be able to provide for these families that have come uh, permanent housing and um, opportunities to find themselves in society in a great and healthy way. And so I would think, like to encourage you to pray with and for them uh, this month. And I think about our church and the generosity, that's what they're displaying, the generosity that we're displaying. And I love this verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. And it says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. As a church, you've modeled that. And may the Lord continue to soften our hearts and open up doors and ways for us to be generous with the monies he's provided. And so I just want us to pray together as a church. Father, you have been so good to us. Your goodness is never failing. Your goodness is on display. The ways that you provide for us, we sometimes are just overwhelmed by your goodness. And so Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the ways that you come and you provide for us when there's times of a storm. I think of these people that have uh, found themselves in the basement of Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park and as Pastor Gerald and his pastoral staff minister to the people as the congregants come around and try to figure out what it is that we can do for these people. Lord, I ask that you would provide gospel conversations that they might be able to understand what true freedom is, freedom in Christ. And Father, I pray for us as a church that as we look for many ways to express our generosity to people, that they would be able to hear the gospel of hope in the conversations that we have. So Lord, we're praying that we would continue to be a church that is generous. Would you provide for our needs? Lord, we can do that now, we can do that uh, during the week, we can be looking around, but Lord, we're asking for you to do a good work through our church in these days ahead. So we are grateful and we are a thankful people for your goodness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in that same spirit, why don't we lift up our voices? Why don't we lift up our hearts as we sing this next song together?
through everything that we go through, Lord. Help us to lean into that and remember that, Lord Jesus. We love you and we give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen, amen. Go ahead and take a seat and turn your attentions to the screen. Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, look, you're going to need a... It's about time. It's my son, by the way. I can say that to him. Yep. Um, you'll need a Bible here in the next few minutes. Um, Acts chapter 16. We're going to do some really fun Bible study in the next little bit. If you do not know me, my name is Jeff. I get the privilege of teaching God's Word here. One of the pastors. And... Um, we want to look at Acts 16, verse 11 to 34. Now, if you were here last week, you will know that verse 11, we already did that. But because I didn't do it, we're going to do it again. Now, I, I actually, there's, there's a reason that I want to do that. And here's why. Have you ever, remember back in school, when you were in your English class, and the English teacher was trying to get you to understand how to read literature, Okay, I know that this is triggering for many people in the room right now. 
But do you remember when they tried to get you to read literature and they would talk to you about different ways that writers organize their stories in order to highlight certain aspects of the characters? So one of the real common ways that writers will do this is that they'll place uh, the story of one, two, three, it's usually in threes, they'll put three characters together and what they mean for you to do is to compare and contrast the evil words on all the tests, to compare and contrast these three characters to understand what the writer is getting at. So they're gonna highlight certain aspects of these different characters that are similar, and they're gonna highlight certain aspects of these characters that are different, so that you can learn, ultimately, what the writer's trying to get at. Well, this is a passage in Acts 16 where Luke, the author, does precisely this. And it makes it kind of fun to study because you already go into it understanding how the thing is structured and set up. So you can go, all right, well, okay, Luke, I get get it. We're going to have three panels, right, three boxes, and we're going to put a character in each one of these boxes. The first one is going to be a woman named Lydia. She's a wealthy fashionista named Lydia, and she comes to faith in Christ. The second one is the opposite side of the socioeconomic spectrum. Still a woman, this time young, oppressed, a slave girl. It doesn't mention that she comes to faith in Christ, but certainly Luke, by putting her together with these three characters, means you to understand that she comes to faith as well. And then the last one is basically, he, he is, a, he is a, a prison guard. Uh, probably has a history in the military, probably was in the Marines out of high school, and he comes to faith in Christ. And so Luke says, all right, let's put all these three in these three boxes, and I want you to compare and contrast what I bring out about these and see what you learn. So that's what I want to do. What we're going to do is we're going to tell three stories in succession, and then at the end, I've got three applications from the comparison of the three stories. Got it? That's a six-point sermon that I hid in three points. Do you got that? That's how we do it. All right, here we go. Character number one, Lydia. Verse 11 of Acts chapter 16. This is a passage that we looked at last week, and so if you are at church, this will sound familiar, but I just want to point out a couple things about her story that will sound similar to what you heard already. So setting sail from Troas, they were stuck in Troas. They didn't know where to go. Remember, they get a dream. Uh, Paul does in the middle of the night, go to Macedonia, which is across the water, okay? It's, it's, it's basically Michigan. You got to go across the water to get there. And so Troas is uh, where they were, and they get in a ship, and they go and they stop on an island called Samothrace, and then the following day, they go to Neapolis, which is on the mainland, which will lead us now to Philippi, which is an important city. It's like, uh, it's a really important city of the region, Uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. That means that if you were born in Philippi, you got automatic Roman citizenship, which was a huge deal. The people in in Philippi felt very much like they were just a little Rome. So Rome was seen as kind of, you ever spent time with people from New York City? From New New York, you know that I'm telling the truth here, even though this might sound offensive. But if you're from New York City, you're like, yeah, we're better. Right? It's the best city in the world. Now everybody in Chicago is like, pfft. Right? But if you were from Rome, it was like being in New York City. You know, this, Philippi is kind of like Chicago. We feel like we're on the same, same level. Well, that's essentially what Philippi was. It was an important city in the region. Lots of very important people would mix and mingle there. It was a leading city of the district of Macedonia, basically just the state, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, right? So we Spend some time there, says Paul, with his friend Silas. And on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed, interesting word, we supposed there was a place of prayer. There's no synagogue in the town. The way that Paul does his ministry is he shows up, and the first place he goes is to a synagogue, because that's where the Jewish people meet, and he is representing the Jewish Messiah and going to preach that he is the king. Well, if there's no synagogue in the area, you got to find out where the Jewish people are gathering. And so apparently he hears through the grapevine, they're down by the riverside. And by they, the people actually mean the women are. I don't know where the men are, 
But there's a bunch of ladies who are gathering down by the riverside on the Sabbath to pray. And they sat down and they spoke to the women who had come together. Now one who heard us was a woman named Lydia. She was from the city of Thyatira. Ooh, Thyatira. Thyatira was swanky. And it was swanky because it was a place that you could find this uh, purple dye. And purple dye was used to make purple clothes. And purple clothes were used to clothe royalty. So, hey, folks, if you want to buy something that looks like what the queen and king wear, you should buy something purple, but it's not going to be cheap. We charge a lot for, them to, for the king and queen to own it, so we're going to charge a lot for you to own it. But by wearing it, you're saying essentially to all of your friends, I'm basically royalty. So, you know, remember back in the day when Lady, Lady Diana, whatever she wore was like the thing? that everyone wore, or is that just me? I'm old. I tried wearing her, anyway. Um, from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple, of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God, meaning that she was on the edges, she's not a Jewish person, but on the edges of the Jewish community. She's a Gentile person on the edge of the Jew, Jewish community, but very, very wealthy. This lady would be akin to some, someone who is from uh, Venice, Italy, who is now living in New York City, in a penthouse apartment, okay? So, very important, influential lady. She, she even owns her own house in Philippi and probably owns something in Thyatira. For a woman in those days to own two properties like that, whoo, sugar mama. It's great, this lady's great. The seller of purple goods, she was a worshiper of, the, of God and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So in other words, Paul's making arguments, and the only way that she ends up hearing the arguments and believing the gospel argument, because that's what it is. It's a, it's a communication, a testimony. It's a good news. It's news telling. She accepts it and believes it and embraces it because God opens her heart to do so. But it's reasoning that's going involved here. So he opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So this really, really wealthy woman, the first thing she does is changes her mind about her money. Luke draws this theme throughout all, all Luke and Acts. He's always showing rich people who either get it and give or rich people who don't get it and end up in places like, you know, the rich man where he says to Lazarus, hey, can I have some, some water for my tongue because I'm dying in here because he's in Hades. Or the rich ruler who just walks away and he goes away sad because he had so much money. And Jesus says how hard it is for the witch people to come to the kingdom of heaven. This is a major theme for Luke. So here's the newest lady in the line of Barnabas who, when he came to faith in Christ, saw there were a bunch of people in the church who were needy and he brought a whole bunch of money from the property that he sold, laid it down in front of the apostles and said, use it for the needs of the community. In the same lineage as Zacchaeus, who when he came to faith in Christ... Here's what it said. Uh, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Jesus invites him after he climbs the tree to see who Jesus is. He's a tax collector, super, super wealthy guy. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I want you to, I'm going to come to your house for lunch today, which is essentially saying, I want to be your friend. So Zacchaeus gets together with him. He has all his tax collector buddies there, and he's so overwhelmed by the grace that's shown him that he says out loud, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And I've if I've defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. I can see that he's a son of Abraham and I can see that he's saved by what he did with his money. You get it? So Lydia is this the newest member of this rich person Christian club, who 
whose life is transformed. Come and stay at my house. I love this last line here. She prevailed upon us. Uh, this is a really strong word in Greek. It's basically, you're spending time with somebody who just keeps begging you to do something over and over again, right? It's Christmas time, so gentlemen, your wife will keep begging you to put up the tree. Just, but it's, it's usually not a, you know, it's, it's, it's a persistent beg. And, and when she says, when you say, I'll do it later, what she wants you to do is now. Later is now. So you're supposed to put up the tree. This is a word that's used actually in the Old Testament when, when uh, you remember the story of Lot, when the angels come to Lot, he lives in, in Sodom, and the angels come down and they're like, hey, we're here, we're just going to stay the night in the public square. And Lot's like, no man, you don't know what my city's like. You're going to get abused there. So come to my house, come to my house, come to my house, come to my house. That action is described as prevailing upon the angels. So when this says this about this woman, she's not saying to these guys, oh, well, if you guys have, don't have a place to stay, you can always stay at my house. What she's doing is saying, oh, you need to come. You have to come. Look at all the God's given me. You have to come. Proactive, not reactive, proactive giving. Not based upon the request of the apostles, but looking for the need and meeting it. That's a gospel lady. All right, that's the first picture. I love Lydia. She's great. All right, second picture is the slave girl. Acts 16. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, right? So they, they keep making a habit of going back to this location. So Lydia presumably is meeting with them, perhaps a few others. They've been there probably for a little while. In fact, we learn pretty quickly that they have been for there for a while. And the reason we know that is because they've got uh, a follower, but not the kind you think. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of, see this word divination? That is the, the spirit of Python. That's actually what the word is. The spirit of Python. You say, what in the world is the spirit of Python? All right, so here's the ancient Greek tale. There is a God named Apollos, and he goes and he kills uh, the Python spirit at the, uh, this big giant snake. He kills this snake at the, at, at the entrance of a cave of oracles. So if you can go into the cave, you can find out the future. So he kills this python, this big snake, out in front of this cave. And now he says, right, so from now on, if you come and you worship me, Apollos, and you enter into this cave as one of my priestesses, you will be able to come back out and you will be able to speak with the python spirit, meaning that you'll be able to give oracles. You'll be able to tell people the future. By the way, so people go to this cave and they'd go inside these priestesses and they'd come back out. And when they'd be hired by people, because who doesn't want to know the future, right? Stock brokers, anyone? No? You don't want to know what the housing market's going to do? Like you, you don't want, because it would be very advantageous to know the future. So lots of people wanted to know the future. This is why people go to tarot card readings these days, right? Because they want to know what's going to happen. Well, in those days, they went to that kind of thing all the time. So these priestesses would come out from the cave and people would hire them. And when they hired them, they would say, I need you to counsel the, 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 the python spirit and tell me what the future is going to be regarding, you know, my, my sister's wedding or whatever. And they'd come out and then they would speak as what they called belly talkers, which means like this. So you and I are listening to this as Christian people. We're like, that's demons. Yeah. Yeah. This is exactly what's going on here. So this girl is demon possessed. But she's making a killing for her owners. Her pimps. Because that's what they are. So. She had a spirit of python. And because of that, she brought her owners much gain. By her fortune telling. She, she is a money maker. She followed Paul and us. Crying out. These men are servants of the most high God. Who proclaimed to you the way of salvation. 
Uh, this is a repeated cry, <laughs> crying out. Can you imagine walking around? This is gonna be a ministry we have at our church. If anyone here just wants to walk around behind people for the rest of the, the, the weekend, uh, just crying out things about them. Let's see how long it takes for the person you're crying out about to turn and say, okay, I'm enough. Probably like a minute. But apparently Paul dealt with this for days. Why? Well, look, Jewish people were not viewed really popularly in those days. In fact, most of the Roman citizens really questioned them because they only believed in one God. And so when everything would go wrong in the society, they always thought the reason that everything's going wrong is because the gods that the Jews aren't worshiping are mad at us. So you didn't want to like trumpet, I'm a Jewish man and I serve Yahweh. If he is to yell at this girl who is well known in the community as a money maker for the guys, <laughs> if he's to yell at her, he's going to basically expose himself as a Jewish man and if it's not the right time, you could probably get a lot of people on your back. It's certainly going to stop the gospel from going forward. So he puts up it for a while. These men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. There's a couple problems with what she's saying now. I mean, at, at, on the first glance, you're like, well, that's, that's not, that seems like a really helpful statement. The problem is, in those days... This phrase, most high God, among Greek people would have most, most understood as Zeus. Not as Yahweh, Zeus. So when she's yelling this, people are listening and they're going, oh, he's a servant of Zeus. Who proclaimed to you, see this word? That's not in Greek. It's not there. What's there is a way of salvation. So these men are servants of Zeus who proclaim to you one of many ways to salvation. How do you feel about it now? If you're Paul, are you thinking, no, this is really helpful? Well, no, not at all. Remember when uh, the Lystrans believed Paul and Barnabas to be Zeus and Hermes, and they came running out, saying, ripping their clothes and saying, no, no, no. We serve Yahweh. We're men like you. So it matters a lot for Paul to be really clear regarding what the gospel is, what it's not, that we're not talking about the gods of your day. We're talking about the one true God and there are no rivals. And he is the only one who provides the only way to salvation in Christ. So, she kept doing this for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, <laughs> he's a patient man, because I would have been greatly annoyed early, he turned and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. That does not mean that it took like 60 minutes for it to, it means right away. All right, but her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone. Look at the language. They seized Paul and they dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. He seized me and dragged me. That does not mean that he came and asked my permission and took me there. They, they forcefully grabbed these men. They dragged them into the marketplace, which is where in those days you would have your public trials. And they go before the rulers of the, of the people. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, now listen to their argument against him. There are three big things they're going to say about Paul. These men are, number one, Jews. So, they're not like us, guys. They're, they're not, they're the people who worship the one God, and then we have floods and tornadoes and things because all the other gods don't like that they're not being worshiped. So, by the way, the Jews have been treated so badly through all of history. You know this, like in, in Russia for years, anytime anything went wrong, everyone pointed the Jews and they did what's called a pogrom which means we're just gonna go out and kill a bunch of Jews, see if that helps, right? You're not making enough money, let's kill the Jews. And it's very much along these lines. These people are Jews, argument one, so. And they're disturbing our city, our fine Roman city. We're supposed to be like Rome and being the, you know, just like it. And we don't want to fall behind Rome. And now this is going to happen and everyone's going to know. You guys who are rulers are supposed to protect our city from this kind of thing. 
and they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Uh, there was a law in Rome that stated uh, no one shall have gods for himself, either new or foreign gods, unless they are officially recognized. It's kind of like China. Like you can worship the gods, but it has to be officially recognized. Okay, is Yahweh officially recognized? No. So we'll put up with the Jews and not try to attack them or anything. We'll tolerate them as long as they stay in their spot. But the moment they come out of it, it's on. And these guys know it. And so in the middle of the marketplace with all the people around and the rulers, they say they're Jews causing a disturbance and they're making us un-Roman. We Americans know that kind of language, right? These people are downright un-American. So the crowd joined in in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. You guys ever heard about like caning that happens in places like Singapore when you chew gum or whatever? Um, there's a lot of rules in Singapore, but that's essentially what it did. They caned them. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks, which were essentially, in those days, there were holes in the wall where you put, they put your feet in, and they had a way to lock them in there. And so the only way that you could, I mean, it was both to keep you there for security and also a form of torture because you couldn't move. You just had your feet in the wall. And if you wanted to sit up, you could sit up, but then eventually you didn't. You lied down. It was always in the same spot. Can you imagine being lying in the, in a, on a hard ground all night long, not being able to roll over? Well, it's a form of torture. They're, in fact, on the inner prison, which is the place that you have the, the highest priority criminal. So they're, they're in the worst place, in the worst position. But this girl, this slave girl, because of the ministry of Paul, almost out of frustration, ends up being freed and delivered from this God? I said, this, that's number two. Here's number three. The jailer. So about midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. <laughs> Sorry, in prison? Has everybody, everybody got that? All right, last time you were in prison? Because I know a lot of you have been in prison, right? Last time you were in prison, okay, maybe not in prison, your in-laws. The last time you were at some, the last time you were in a location that you did not want to be in, around midnight, you were like, praise the Lord, praise, yep. These guys are. They probably can't sleep. Obviously, the feet are in the stock. So I'm you know, not getting a lot of sleep. And so they're sitting next to each other and going, what should we do? Well, it's a worship. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Probably out of, like, shock in some regards. And also because, I mean, you don't usually get concerts in prison. So listening to them. And, and suddenly, there's a great earthquake. And the foundations of the prison were shaken, including the wall where the stocks were, right? Go crack, go the stocks, and crack goes where the bars were, and they fall down. And immediately all the doors were open. And everyone's bonds were unfastened. If you were right here, let's pause for just a second. If that happens to you, O servant of Yahweh, after you've been singing praises to his name and you know about the way he's delivered people. You know about the story about how he got Peter out of prison. What are you doing right now? What are you, I'm thinking, the Lord has come through again. Let's get out of here. So when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. In that culture, it was an honor and shame kind of culture and if you were an old military man and you'd been put in charge of prisoners, your life was tied to theirs. If you lost them, if something happened to them while on your, on your charge, your job is to kill yourself. It's, it's like an honor suicide. So he's about to kill himself because he's a good Roman. 
supposing that the prisoners has escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, don't harm yourself. We stayed. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and uh, trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Like, who does this? And then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is a good question for the evangelists, isn't it? He hasn't preached the gospel to this guy. What we know is he's sung the songs, probably had gospel stuff in him. But he initiates the discussion about salvation. Why? Because the dude stayed. I mean, look at the love they showed for me. These guys must be caring for me more than the government does. <clears throat> They've never done this for me. What, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household. Households always believe before they're baptized. That's another story. It's any, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their wounds. This guy who was part of inflicting their wounds goes to washing their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them up into his house, just like Lydia, and set food before him. The guy who was there starving them in the prison is now feeding them in his home. What a dramatic transformation. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. All right, so one, two, and three. All right, let's put our college English class hats on. What do we see when we compare and contrast these? And there's a lot of things that you could probably point out, and most of the things that you would point out are probably what Lucas has in mind to do in the comparing and contrasting. But I'll just point out three that I think are pretty obvious. One, the Holy Spirit gathers all kinds into the church. The Holy Spirit gathers all kinds into the church. In fact, you should expect the church, the, the gathered community of Jesus in any location, not to be made up of just one kind of person, but all kinds of people with all kinds of weird stories and backgrounds. People who's, who grew up with the faith and they came to faith when they were four because their mom led them in a prayer to Jesus over the, the breakfast table. People who recently got out of drugs and alcohol addiction and have come to faith and are wowed by how much this God could love them despite all they've done. People who are black, people who are white, people who are Asian, people who are from Africa, people who are from Finland, all kinds with all kinds of backgrounds. And that's what these three people are. Just think about them again. You've got this really, really rich woman. She's had a cultured background. She's, she's a remarkable lady. She's the kind of person we're like, well, if she comes into our church, we're, I mean, the giving's gonna increase. And then you have this slave girl who's on the opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And when she comes into the church, she's probably only taken. <laughs> I mean, she's had such a mess. And then you have this prison guard who was probably in the Roman military, retired in Philippi. I, I've been trying all week to try to think to myself, all right, all right Jeff, what are, the, what are the modern equivalents? And this is what I've come up with. Uh, a New York City fashion designer elite living in, cent in a Central Park penthouse, a couch-surfing prostitute beaten up every night by her pimp, and a, truck, a Trump-supporting truck driver who's a former Marine. You know, the guy with the big flag in the back of his thing, the American flag and two Trump flags. That's, that's who you have. 
One lady who hangs around in all the wine and cheese parties. One guy who drinks so many beers. And one girl who's got nothing but oppression. There's some, there's some evidence to suggest that Luke, the guy who wrote, of course, all of this, that this is his hometown, that this is his home church. So when you're reading this, it's like Luke is like, oh, let me tell you what happened in Philippi. Here are three of my friends. I sit with them in church. When I was in New Zealand, there was a, there was a lady, actually, who used to bring uh, to our church. She used to bring our chickens. No, in New Zealand, they call them chooks. Ch a chicken is a chook. And they called her the chook lady. We, we, knew, we knew her name, but everybody kind of said she, she's the chook lady with sort of secret code saying, hey, we might need to be kind of aware of her there because she was not all, she was not all there. But she used to come to the church because... Somewhere in her distant past, she had trusted Jesus and was still following him. And she had chickens, and she would put them underneath the seats. So I'd preach, and in the middle of the sermon, <laughs> next to her would sit one of the guys who would often sit next to her. It was a guy named Hudson, a dear friend, older gentleman. He was the president of a building corporation in New Zealand. He lived on top of one of the prettiest hills in Nelson, New Zealand, overlooking the entire bay, the airport. Beautiful home. And I remember preaching there, looking at Hudson and the Chuck lady, just thinking, where else in the world do these people get along? At the end of the service, he used to give her big hugs. Where else in the world does this suit-wearing businessman who everyone in the community knows love on someone everyone thinks is a nut job? Oh, it's the Church of Jesus. That's what it's supposed to actually be looking like, right? I mean, this is why Paul says stuff like this. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't it interesting, too, the stories about women? Isn't it interesting that one of the stories is about a slave girl and a Greek man? You, you know what this passage is saying? That you don't have any step up in comparison to any other Christian. That, that there is no one who comes to faith in Christ who says, well, I'm here because I was part of the better group. There are no better groups. I don't care the skin color, your upbringing, the success you've had in life. I don't care what the whole world tells you. There are no better groups. We are all equally burned and buried under sin. And yet equally raised in Christ. Who does not hold, he does not hold one culture above another culture, above another culture. Listen to me, I am not in any way suggesting that when you come to faith in Christ that you abandon your culture. Jesus loves all the cultures. He wants to redeem all the cultures. Somebody who is from some Indian culture doesn't need to abandon their Indianness to come into to the white church. They don't have to do that. But what they do need to understand is that the white person and the black person, the Indian person and the Pakistani person are now your family. And your allegiances now lie with them. So the rest of the world can talk about identity politics and you can get into, oh, well, you should recognize yourself as these cross-section of these five identities. Well, a Christian says, right, yes, I have several identities God has given me, but the one identity that defines me is I am a bondservant of Jesus. And when the society gets all up in arms and starts fighting each other about all sorts of things, the Christian church sits down and we say, brother, black brother, tell me what it's like to live in this culture. I want to hear from you. I want to know and listen to you. And he says, white brother, I want to understand what it's like from your point of view and that we can sit together and listen. Man, 
I don't know if you know, Pakistanis and Indians don't, they don't like each other, and yet in Christ, they're one. There's no Jew or Arab. They're one in Christ Jesus. When you come to faith in Christ, they're defined as Christian first. Are they Arabs still? Yeah, sure. Are they still Jewish? Uh-huh, that's their background. But they're followers of Jesus first. And the church should recognize and embrace this. And what that means ultimately is you should rejoice in the differences we have and the stories that you hear from different people. Look, I have a podcast and people have asked me, why do you do the podcast you do? It's just basically a bunch of stories about people's faith life, you know? Yeah, that's right. Because I just want everyone everywhere to know that everyone has a story. And they all have stories about how God has worked in their life. Some of them are going to be Lydia's, some slave girls, and there's going to be some truck driving Trump supporters. And they've all come to faith in Jesus. And they break all the boundaries of all the things that we've often thought about who belongs and who doesn't. So we rejoice in the differences and the different story, and we, and we embrace our greatest identity. That we're Christians above all things. Second thing I think we learn, we compare and contrast, is that the Holy Spirit is working it all out. So when you read this passage, I focused on the three characters that this seems to be about. There's other characters, ancillary characters involved in it. I mean, you've got the the authorities who are beating these guys up. You've got a few other ancillary characters, but mostly it's these three characters. But I do think that there's one other character who shows up more than any of them. But his name's not mentioned much. It's the Holy Spirit. And here's where he shows up. He gave a dream to Paul that they should go to Macedonia in the middle of the night. In fact, he stopped them from going a couple other places prior to this passage. The Spirit of Jesus stopped him. The Holy Spirit stopped him. Then he gets a dream from the Holy Spirit to go to Macedonia. So they go to Macedonia. Lydia comes to faith in Jesus because the Spirit opens her heart. The slave girl is delivered in the name of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit applies the victory of Jesus over the demonic power in her life. The foundations of the jail didn't just shake what luck. The Spirit of God is shaking it up. He's, at, he's everywhere. The, the title of the book, The Acts of the Apostles, is really misleading. And it sort of makes us a little arrogant because it's it is kind of the Acts of the Apostles, but it's mostly the Acts of this Holy Spirit, sometimes involving the Apostles. So what you're reading in the book is basically a testimony over and over and over again that the Holy Spirit is always at work, no matter what you think, no matter how long you're waiting, no matter how things seem right now, the Spirit is operating and orchestrating and doing great things that you will one day see. And that your life and my life should be lived with a constant recognition that that's true. The book of Esther, in the Old Testament, God's name's not mentioned. But how does Esther become queen? And how does, I mean, the whole thing is about God. But that's how it feels to us. That's how it feels to us. There are characters. You're a character. You're a character. You're a character. You're a character. I'm a character. We're all characters. We live in a world full of characters. The one character who's operating more than anyone else is the one we don't see. And the moment you start changing your mind to recognize, oh, he actually is the main character. We're the ancillary ones. This is, these are all stories. Our stories are all stories about how the Holy Spirit has worked in the lives of us, how the Holy Spirit has orchestrated all these things. Praise be his name. What joy comes when you start thinking about that? We might not see it or be aware of it completely, but God is on the move. We may be waiting, but he's not. I love deep dish pizza in Chicago. I know, you said, yeah, right? So I came to Chicago, gained like 20 pounds. Thank you. That was great. It was mostly in pizza weight. And um, so I've been to Chicago. One of the things I've noticed about deep dish pizza, though, is it takes a long time 
to get. So I'm, I come from like the world of Papa John's and Domino's where they're like, it'll be ready in six minutes, you know, and you get it and you eat it and you're like, this is good. Little Caesars, you just walk in, here's a pizza. But when you order Giordano's or Lou Malnati's or whatever your favorite place, when you go in there, they're like, it's going to be 45 minutes. You're like, oh, come on. And then you're sitting there waiting for 45 minutes. And when I first was here, I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. Better be good. Right? I just am sick and tired of waiting for this pizza. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Everybody's on their phone. <laughs> Finally, the thing comes and you're like, whoa, that's a, that's a, that's a big da pizza. And they start cutting it up and put it on your plate and you put the first bite. Do you remember the first time you ever had Chicago deep dish pizza? Like it is ecstasy. <laughs> like there's this, you're like, whoa, okay, slow down. <laughs> right? If you could go back and experience any time in your life, it would be like the birth of your kids, the marriage, and the first deep dish. Right? <laughs> this, this would be your life. But this is a lovely image for what it's like to be Christians in this age. We, we, are, we feel constantly waiting but what we don't see is everyone working hard to make the very thing that we're going to rejoice in so much when it comes but we don't see them working so we're like what's going on here nobody cares for us now most of us have had enough deep dish pizza now that we're like well I don't complain anymore why because it's so consistently that way you have to get you get it you wait and then eventually they bring it out Right, so every Christian in the world who's waiting for God to come through and who in the past has seen God come through after they've been waiting a long time should also say, oh, we're to, this time of waiting is to be expected. But when God comes through, oh boy, that's going to be a pizza. So look, you might be sitting and waiting for whatever. God's put you on the shelf for a little bit. And you're like, oh, this stinks and I don't want to do this. And I've been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying into it. And you're waiting for the pizza. And you're like, man, come on, bring the pizza. But I'm telling, I'm telling you, on the basis of how God has come through in your life up to this stage now, and how he will, he's promised to come through in ages to come, it will absolutely be worth it. So just push on one more day. The Holy Spirit is working it all out. Last one. The Holy Spirit transforms lives. Because that's what happens here, isn't it, at the end? One of the interesting things about each one of these parties is it's not just that these people come to faith in Jesus, right? And they go their way. They don't just walk to the front. We'll pray a prayer, and then they go their merry way and live the way they used to live. The transformation in each of their lives is remarkable. I used to have all my money, and I used to use it all for me, and now I'm just ecstatic and a Aggressive in sharing it with you. You don't even ask. I'm ready to share it. I, I used to be an oppressed woman who was treated so badly, but now I've been delivered completely, and I'm not making money for them anymore. I used to be this hard man working for the Romans, making sure I did my duty all the time, and then all this. You get what you give in this life. So I'm there, tit for tat, the earth shakes, the whole place opens, and my expectation is they're all going to be gone, but they didn't leave. Why didn't you leave? Tell me why you didn't leave. And he goes from being this man who was inflicting wounds to one who was healing the wounds. Do you not see the transformation that takes place in the lives of each one of these people? This is what it looks like to be a Christian. It looks like a transformed life. There's a reason why we call it the fruit of the Spirit. See, I know that the Spirit is at work in your life because I can see fruit. Just like I know it's an apple tree when I see the apple. So love, joy, peace. These are not things that you're supposed to feel. I'm not asking you the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I have love. I have peace. No, no, no. The fruit of the Spirit is the love you show, the peace you show, the joy you show. And I ought to be able to see it in your life. That you're a genuine believer. That what, what you once were is not what you are now. Are you perfect? No. But there has been a move, man. There's been a transformation that has taken place and is taking place. There's fruit there. 
But how do you produce fruit? So let me finish with this. I, I brought this up a number of, I think we were talking about John's gospel at one point. There's a passage in John 15 that talks about the vine and the branches. And it talks about fruit. And there's an image there Jesus made. He says, I am the vine. You are the branch. He who abides in me, who continues in me, and I in him, produces much fruit. So, so listen, the fruit is a product of the relationship with the branch and the vine. Yes? The moment the branch starts looking toward fruit and going, fruit, come on, fruit, doesn't come. Because the fruit is a product, a natural product of the relationship between the branch and the vine. You want to you grow fruit in your life? You want this fruit of the Spirit? Let me tell you, it will happen the more you remember Jesus. It'll happen more you reflect on who Jesus is and what he's done. It's Christmas time. Christmas day, I show up at your house. And in an envelope, I've got a present for you. You open it up. You say, you've paid off my mortgage. I say, yes, I'm that kind of guy. I give one to your brother. And he opens it up. And I've paid off his iPass. Right? He owed money on I-90. And I paid the $5, right? Hey, I need a ride to the airport, guys. Who's willing to do it? And I'm going to tell you that the person who was just paid off, whose mortgage was just paid off, is going to jump out of their seat. That's it? You just need a ride to the airport? Yeah, which airport, man? Atlanta? We're going. Like, I don't care how long it takes. You're my buddy. The other guy's going to be like, ah, ride to an airport, I don't know. I'll probably accrue more than $5 worth of iPass for that. So in other words... One's willingness to sacrifice, one's willingness to respond with grand action is completely dependent upon how much you think you've been given. So Christian, how much have you been given? Pray for us, Lord. I'm, I love this little passage. It's so delightful, Father. I find myself in some of these characters. And, Father, we know that the whole in the kingdom, we are told that we will all stand before the throne and we will worship the Lord in white sheets all together. Everybody, it doesn't matter where you came from, who you are, you're going to have the same clothes. I pray, Father, that the church of Jesus Christ in our day would be a, an appropriate um, prelude to that day. That when people walk into the church, when we engage in the church, that they'll know that we're Christians by our love for one another and our sacrifice for one another. And I pray, Lord, that that sacrifice and love would be the product of what we really understand you to have done for us. So spirit, work. We know you are. Work it all out. We hand to you all of our heart grievances and difficulties and frustrations. And we will wait, Lord, knowing that in only a little bit, in only a little bit, it will all be worth it. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Stand.
great reminder, we have been given much. We've been given much in the gospel that we can be set free from sin and we can have the hope of Christ. Think about the opportunity we have through this next season to present the true hope of the gospel with those that are family, those are friends, those who are co-laborers. May we be a people who are on mission to do that well. We've been given much and now we get to share much. And speaking of sharing, I love the fact that three of our campuses have a Hope Center, but all of our campuses are working together to provide a little bit of tangible love to people who are in need. And we're going to do something a little different this Christmas. We are going to try to provide Christmas for each of the children that come to the Hope Center. And so we've got some names on a, a table out there, little ornaments. And if you'd like to give, that we can give something to the families who come in for Christmas on the 16th, that would be awesome. What a tangible expression of like, we love you, we want you to have a great Christmas, but here's also the message of the gospel. So if that would be something that would encourage your heart to encourage somebody else's, uh, do that today. Listen, if you came here today and you're like, I, I need that hope, I need some prayer. We have, we'll have some people down front here afterward. We'd love to pray with you and be able to see the Lord do a great work in your life. And if you're new or relatively new and we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm going to be hanging out in the lobby. But uh, know this, as we go out on mission, you are loved. Have a